Hello, welcome to the RIBA China app. Initiated by Aslina Bomber, this app aims at sharing knowledge and expanding debate on the RIBA platform in China. This is the first edition of the program. I'm Zhang Li, Dean of the School of Architecture of Tsinghua University, and it is my pleasure to be appointed the first editor of the China app and moderate, of course, this first talk today. Today's topic is carbon neutrality, when and how. The relevance of this topic is self-explanatory, and we do have the physical evidence out there in, in the air today. We have the honour of inviting two of the leading professionals and academics in the world today to join the talk. Mr. Ishtiak Zaya Titters. He is a renowned architect from Bangladesh, and he is also the first vice president of UIA. He chairs the UIA SDG Commission, and he is joining us now from about 3,000 miles away. Darker. Hello, Ms. Ish. And sitting next to me is Professor Yang Shidong. He is a professor from Tsinghua University in Building Science and Technology. He is a renowned scientist in China in built environment energy engineering. Hello, Professor Yang. Hi. So the format today is these two great personal will give us two presentations first and then we will start a discussion. First presentation from Professor Yang Shidong. Hello, uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, talk very briefly about the carbon neutral buildings and uh, particularly the role of uh, renewable energy in order to achieve the carbon neutral buildings. Uh, so uh, I think uh, everybody already known China has made a commitment to reach the carbon neutrality uh, before 2060. So this announcement really surprised the whole world. Uh, in fact, uh, China already made an earlier uh, a commitment to reach the peak of carbon emissions by 2030. So together, these two commitments really shows China's determination uh, to uh, have a uh, uh, future uh, uh, sustainable uh, world. Um, so this announcement, announcement was made by President Xi Jinping in the 75th uh, session of the UN General Assembly on the September the 22nd uh, last year. So building is an important part of China's carbon emission. According to our statistic data, uh, China, Chinese buildings currently consume more than 900 million tons of whole equivalents of energy, so uh, plus another 90 million tons of biomass. Um, so uh, these, the energy is actually consumed by different building sectors, for example, the rural buildings, residential buildings, and the public buildings, etc. Um, so the pathway to reach the so-called zero carbon building is not simple. So we already know a lot, we heard a lot about low energy or sometimes so-called ultra low energy or nearly zero energy buildings. But this should be only the beginning. So we also need to do a lot. For example, we need to make the buildings use electricity rather than fossil fuel, so it's so-called building electrification. And also we need to use a lot of renewable energy sources, either on-site or off-site. And also, very importantly, the buildings have to be flexible. Uh, in, other, in other words, it has to work with the power grid to make sure that the energy supply and energy demand match each other. And then finally, we can reach the so-called zero carbon uh, buildings. 
So many, many years ago, uh, we actually made the effort um, to build a so-called low energy demonstration building on the Tsinghua University campus. So this building is east of the School of Architecture main building. At that time, because of te technology limitation, we were mainly focused on how to reduce the energy demand of this building. For example, how to use good thermal insulation and shading, and also double skin facade and that kind of thing. Although there are also some other traditional technology being used, such as the green roofs, and a little bit of the solar PV, uh, and also the solar lighting, etc. Uh, 10 years later, uh, in China, there has been a lot of new technology demonstration projects. For example, this is an office building uh, in the Chinese Academy of Building Research. This building was built in 2017. Um, so this is so-called nearly zero energy office building, and they use a lot of new technologies. So for example, the thermal energy storage, uh, the solar power generation, and also the um, uh, a lot of uh, intelligent technologies. Um, so the Chinese government actually has been upgrading the building energy codes. So through uh, since 1980s till now, there has been different levels of energy conservation codes. So let's say if we can consider the 1980s building as a baseline, and then step by step, we see the energy demand is decreasing significantly. So currently we are at this level, that means for the first step, we would like to reduce the energy consumption by 65% compared to the baseline. And then the second step, we want to achieve so-called net zero energy building, and that will be more than 80% of energy consumption uh, reduction. And then the third level will reach the net zero energy building. So in that case, it's very, very small demand in terms of energy consumption. But this is still not what we define as the zero carbon building. Uh, so, because usually from the demand side, we have a we have a uh, the requirement first, and then we do whatever we can to lower the demand to a very small level, and then we would like to do another thing, and that is on the supply side, we need to generate the energy and to match the energy demand. That's so, for example, using the solar, uh, solar thermal, solar PV, wind, hydro, or biomass. But this is only for the operation of the building. We also need to consider the construction materials. So that's also part of the carbon emission calculation. So we call this embodied CO2. So in order to make this a pure zero carbon, we also need to offset the carbon emission through the embodied CO2. So that makes the, the energy supply side even much harder. And not only that, other than we have accumulated equivalents between supply and demand, we also need to make sure that energy supply and demand, they match each other from time to time. In other words, our building demand, energy demand is not continuous number. It's not a constant, so it varies with time, varies with weather, temperature outside. So our renewable energy supply is also fluctuating. So how to make sure that our fluctuating demand and fluctuating supply, they match each other from different times. So this is a really a big challenge. So sometimes people make a misunderstanding so they say annual zero energy, meaning the total energy supply and total energy demand, they match each other. This is not sufficient. So this is not a real zero carbon building. So zero carbon building really means at any moment, our supply and demand, they match well each other. So for example, in the traditional building, you have a demand curve, which is fluctuating from work days or weekend days. And you also have the supply energy curve that's also fluctuating from different times. So we have a so-called net energy from the supply minus the demand. 
So the net energy curve has to be flattened out. How to do that? Then we need a very challenging technology that is energy storage. So we need to have the storage capacity to make this flatten or coming down to zero line. So this is a big challenge to us. How to do that? Well, energy storage can be done through different ways. For example, in the future, our transportation will be mainly electri electrified by electrified uh, vehicles, so they have a big battery. So we can use the battery as a moving the, uh, electricity storage. So that can be used to take the power from the grid and then charge to the building when it's needed. So make, it a, make the whole curve flatten out. So this is a very powerful way. Uh, of course, we can also use the um, batteries, but the regular battery is very expensive at this point. Another possibility is to use the energy storage, thermal energy storage. For example, our building envelope using the water tanks, chilled water tank or hot water tank, to make this building demand and supply matching each other. So make the building flexible. So this is a critical point we have to do. Um, in order to um, demonstrate all these different technologies, in recent years we have tried to make the so-called zero carbon uh, projects happening in different locations. So this is the first demonstration village uh, we, we, we conducted in Qinghai province. Qinghai is in the northwest uh, region. They have a rich amount of solar. So in this village, we try to utilize the passive solar or the active solar, and we try to analyze the total amount of solar energy available, and then make that matching the energy demand. So for the village level, it's not that hard to reach the zero carbon. However, if we want to move this up to the town level, so this is in Inner Mongolia, which is a very cold climate uh, region. So here, the heating is a main energy demand. So how can we get this zero carbon? Well, we consider, other than the solar, we also consider the so-called biomass, which is also a zero carbon energy source. So we combine the clean thermal mass and the solar and also the passive design technologies and then we meet the energy demand for the whole county, uh, for the whole town. And then the more challenge is actually if you want to make it an even larger region, for example, a county level. So this is in Richen, which is in Shanxi province. So this is an ongoing project. We call this regional demonstration of zero carbon county project. Um, and so we need to consider a lot more comprehensively how to utilize uh, different energy, renewable energy technologies and also try to reduce the energy demand the best we can. And this is only not only about the building energy, but also it's about transportation and the industry and the farming. So we have to consider all these together. So our energy supply has to be large and also flexible, and storage has to be economical, and our demand has to be reduced to the minimum level. So in order to reach the county level uh, carbon neutrality. So uh, just very briefly summarized, uh, we actually are at the beginning of getting to the point of carbon neutrality in buildings. There is a long way to go, uh, technology development, policy support, financial support, and uh, overall I think uh, uh, China has a lot of reasons uh, to pursue a carbon neutrality, to reach a more sustainable future because uh, we cannot afford to have the resource depletion or environmental deterioration or ecosystem degradation or energy. We want to make sure our energy is secure. So we need to go sustainable, go renewable, go clean, and go carbon neutral. So just briefly conclude, uh, this concludes my, my brief talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Professor Yang. I, I think you have made a very important point um, that carbon neutrality or carbon net zero is very much about the cycle of energy. 
And given the vast Chinese countryside and the population base actually is utterly important for the rural to be as carbon neutral as the urban. And you certainly have given us your approach is to make these self-sustained communities uh, light, compact solutions. Brilliant ideas. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ish, Professor Yang has talked about carbon neutrality or carbon net zero from a energy point of view. I guess your talk will be a design point of view. Is it? Yes. So would you please? Thank you, Ish. The race to net zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Yang. Uh, you know, I mean, when you talk about NSEO, you have to talk about numbers, and numbers are very, very important. And uh, it's all about people's life. I mean, the example you have shown, this reflects how it is going to impact. It is not only number, the people's life matters. So, I'll uh, briefly go into uh, the holistic view of uh, how architects going to relate and why it's important for us to be here. So I'll start with this slide. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very uh, important for me. I use it very occasionally, uh, very often. Uh, this is 2030, all the cities of the world. And you can see how concentrated it is in, in China, in Asia, in Europe, and in America. Only two percent of world, two to three percent of world land is occupied by these cities, and more than fifty percent people live in the cities. So, natural is a race for us, obviously. And look at this map. This has been produced by IHED in 2014, predicting the largest cities of the world by 2025. 50 cities you can see. And the black dots are all the Chinese cities. And you can see, I'm from Dhaka and you, you are seeing in Beijing, both are on the top 10. So cities are the places where we think the most development is going on, will be going on, continue. But we have to take care of our rural areas as well. So as an architect, it is very important that the, the way cities are planned, built and managed is a key to reduce the carbon emission and keep global warming. So if you really want to reach the uh, what we agreed in climate change uh, Paris Agreement in 2015, we have to start uh, running. Uh, tourist is not enough, it has to be raised. So, this is a uh, slide prepared by UN Habitat. As you can see, the 15% building sector and the transport sector, so we can reduce the uh, greenhouse emission 90%. So, this is the picture and sector breakdown of technically feasible and level of mitigation measure to achieve 90% greenhouse. So, as an architect, the building sector had to act. There's no point we can sit tight. Now I, I will, I'm, I'm going to look at, I'm one of the contributors to New Urban Agenda from EYA. And this has been agreed by more than 200 countries, including China, including Bangladesh. And we committed, we firstly, we identified that urban from in infrastructure and building design are most, the greatest, uh, think and resource efficient, the foster energy efficient rene renewable energy. So this is very important that we, we acknowledge that it is it is uh, uh, drivers of cost and resource efficiency. Then the natural resource management, we agree to protect uh, and improve the urban ecosystem. We also agree to foster ecosystem based solution, also promote cross sector cooperation, and also we agree that. We will go for community-based uh, energy plans. So these are, you can see the number 44, 65. These are the numbers of the commitment in New Urban Agenda. But did we do anything? Look at the current situation. This is a report uh, came out uh, weeks, weeks back. Uh, 
from uh, UNFCC. The uh, NDC country synthesis report says that we definitely achieved a lot uh, in terms of greenhouse uh, gas emission reduction, but this is not enough. We actually redouble the effort if you really want to keep the temperature increase beyond uh, below 1.5 by the end of this century. So the, uh, the way we are going ahead is not enough, so we have to move fast. So if you really want to move fast, I know these numbers are very, very important and one of the things we look at the, as, a, as a single and is said to be multiple focus. We have to think about the uh, reduced spatial inequality, energy share perspective citizen region, and the climate action and improve urban environment and effective urban crisis prevention. So these are the drivers of the chain we have to think about. Uh, not only if you really want to reach to net zero, Professor Young has mentioned that the uh, pathway to net zero is not easy. Actually, it is not only easy, but to retain the net zero it is very difficult. So we have to think about all this driver of the change that we need to consider. So, in present day, to achieve net zero, cities and rural areas must be well designed and well managed. It's a very important and as a market, we have to act on that first. So what do you do to attain net zero? In point of markets, I mean, we have to think different and be happy what we have. The southern blocks, southern countries, they want to become like a northern developed countries. But in the race of net zero, there are a lot of things, a lot of systems, a lot of eco-based solution already exist in the global south. So all you have to do is value your own system and upgrade it with technology and innovation. You don't have to follow the knock. Just be what you have, be happy with what you have and think different. So how do you go to that place or how do you think in a different way? So to have the natural response in design, it has to be responsive to place, responsive to time, responsive to ecology, responsive to people, and obviously responsive to nature. Um, I, mean, I mean, this is something we have to not only as an architect, but we have to have a cross border relationship with all the professional researchers and academicians. So, share knowledge, a collective knowledge. One cross discipline is very, very important. I mean, uh, today we are sitting with our uh, professor uh, 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 from the engineering uh, point of view and uh, responses are very consensus because we have uh, many differences among the region and that has to be uh, amplified and also uh, unified. So, act efficiently, responsibly, transparent. It is very, very important to retain the, uh, to continue our journey towards net zero. And speaking with one voice on areas of agreement, I know we have disagreement, but in, 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 in region wise, but that, that has to be achieved through our consensus. So, I'm going to look for some solution very quickly. Uh, these are uh, in terms of our editor. On the left, you can see Lanegro Group has started a project called SDG Village, and then the White Design Group. Initiated project LIDA, growing the living affordable community in UK, and Willard Architects, the winning design in China uh, for post COVID city. So it is a self sufficient city. Uh, from our EYA SDG Commission, along with uh, uh, our colleague from Copenhagen, uh, KDK, uh, we, we did a competition on uh, SDG guide to uh, for. Architects, and I'm going to show some projects that are related to uh, Net Zero. This is a project uh, we have in uh, Sydney Water Reuse Project. That is actually a uh, 44 hectare uh, industrial park comes from Indian storm sewage reuse area. Uh, then, this is a project in Denmark. This is also uh, it's a radical approach. The street is designed in a concave way. So through design, you accumulate water and discharge into the ground and the rainwater overflow solution is being done. This is another project in Cameroon, 
So through design, how NGO worker and pygmy community. Uh, this is a collective approach, harvesting portable water from air. Through architectural design, this structure collects the water due from the air. Then this another project from uh, Burkina Faso, uh, architect uh, uh, Kare, and this is an, uh, to reduce operational and embedded energy, naturally ventilated, and with unique wind turbine, wind uh, catcher on the top. The next one is Arcadia Education Project. This is from my country, Bangladesh. This is uh, a little bit flat there. So, uh, this is an alternative solution, but I think these solutions can be in the mainstream. This is a flexible structure, the building flows when there is a three, three meter flood comes, the building remains operational and it's can store. And this is to uh, attract the local community and local people. The next project is hydropower plant. Uh, hydropower at local level. So you can see we decentralize the energy supply system and is blend with the uh, nature, the landscape and uh, becomes a tourist attraction. The next project is uh, in Auckland, New Zealand. This 700 meter redundant highway transformed into a bicycle lane. Uh, the LED lit uh, uh, sensor driven uh, lighting system actually leads the pathway when the uh, bicycle uh, is moving around. So you have an active lighting system in the evening. A very interesting place uh, uh, in the city. So, the last one is Minghu Wetland Park in China. This is an example of the Spawn City concept that uh, China already uh, announced that they're trying to reach 70 to 80 percent cities to be to capture, reuse, and inflate. There is uh, strong water and flood water and rain uh, strong water. So through design, we can achieve these things. So. To me, is a public and green area play a key role in as a carbon sink. We are talking about the passive works of uh, doing uh, reaching to the net zero and the wetland parks. Uh, this water demand, wastewater treatment, nature-based solution. This is the I mean uh, of, uh, also the municipal waste management. So renewable energy and uh, uptake of mi microbes is our very to uh, reach into the next year solution. And the knowledge exchange on science, technology, and innovation. The project we have seen is our through this uh, science, technology, innovation, and to benefit the uh, carbon neutral development. Access to different multi level funds. Money is very important, as uh, Professor Young had mentioned in his last slide. So, this is very important and also capacity development and develop partnership. Partnership with civil society, private sector, professional, academia, research institute and their existing network. I recall our uh, recent fiscal uh, email, Locator and Basel, that message to the world, we have to learn how to use less money to do more and also learn how to play with the planet, not to fight against climate. So these are uh, solutions exist in this world and one big issue is the investors and business community. They have to be in alignment with architects, designers, thinkers, policy makers and these are the two uh, uh, solutions exist in the world that we, we can think of like uh, solution plus project. Uh, they are working to kickstart transition towards low carbon, uh, urban mobility, and also making city resident uh, 2030. They are um, a cross stakeholder initiative to improve residence in the city. So many of the cities have joined this program and going towards a solution. So uh, think different in, in terms of business investment. I recall our uh, Hero Professor Yunus, the Nobel laureate who is promoting social business in the world. So whatever we do has to have impact.
compared to the our society. So the wind alone is a major consumer of energy and natural resources and a very massive producer of waste. Furthermore, how we eat can exaggerate inequalities and affect health. So it is our it is truly matters how people eat, where and at what cost. For people and for the environment. So from UIA we place to hold the carbon neutrality at the core of our action to build better cities for the benefit of all people while conserving our resources and using them wisely with shared knowledge and wisdom. Thank you very much for being with me. Well, thank you so much, Ish Diak. It's a wonderful presentation and certainly many, many inspirational points. I think the key message is that design is one great thing if we are to achieve carbon neutrality because design addresses all the issues of people's lifestyles. And design is always the great art of mixing knowledge, partnership, and good effort. And certainly you have demonstrated many, many projects, including probably yours, um, in your country, from your country, um, wonderful projects um, that greatly encourage us to um, make this effort, take this um, march towards carbon neutrality. Thank you very much indeed, Ishtiak. Um, thank you. Um, we, we have finished the two presentations and now we will have a very short discussion. I will ask these two leading figures questions um, and they will discuss the first question is, of course, both of you are very, very confident um, on carbon neutrality and you certainly have faith in carbon, carbon neutrality. And my question is, because there are many, many sceptics out there, naysayers out there saying, no, no, these are only good wills, they will not materialise. So, in your view, do you think carbon net zero is truly achievable? If so, when? Professor Yang. Okay, well I think um, this is an understandable question because we, we have a good wish. I think everybody agrees that the climate change is, is a real threat to our humankind. And uh, so we need to do things, we need to make an action and to prevent uh, the, the climate change problems from happening. So from that side, I think it's uh, less debate. I think the main issue is how to achieve uh, the goal. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, more than 100 countries have made a commitment for different levels of commitment about uh, to reach the carbon reduction uh, and also ultimately want to reach the carbon neutrality. Uh, I think on one side, the technology is developing, um, so people are learning from each other. People are innovating and trying to have better knowledge and better technologies. So this is ongoing, so that's why it's not mature yet somehow. But I think uh, with the current knowledge level of uh, development and also with the current effort, I think the first order of the business is that important thing is we recognize this is a big issue, we have to do something on that. So we, if we have that trust, then I think the rest shouldn't be that difficult. Although we have, we have to carefully say, what do we mean by carbon neutrality? So do we really mean absolutely zero emission or we mean very small amount of emission? And also we want to make sure that at the end, the carbon emission and uh, the carbon sink, they uh, calculate, they calculate properly and they add together to, uh, to, to so-called zero thing. So I think it doesn't really matter very strict, strictly how we define that, but I think what matters is what kind of effort we want to make and then eventually I think this should be achievable. Right? So I'm kind of optimistic about Great. Um, we, we are certainly impressed by your optimism. Um, Ish? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm a 
also optimistic. <laughs> and uh, things that we have to recognize, we have already recognized through our early segment. We have to commit with we, we most of the countries that made commitment. Now we have to act. I congratulate and welcome China because Chinese Premier uh, announced a few days back in the United Nations that they will not go for any coal power uh, power generation plants in the globe. Uh, these are the acts that needs to be done. Like USA coming back to Paris Agreement is an Global leaders need to be uh, acknowledged, act on it. And then we need the technology knowledge to reach for carbon neutrality that exists, and we will continue to uh, uh, explore more new uh, ideas. But the funding is important. In my first slide, I showed $90 trillion is required to mitigate all the problems of the CD, including climate change. So that has to be equally distributed. Now, I, there is nothing called absolute. We have to reassess in 2030 how much we could achieve. I mean, I know there, uh, when I talk about definitely building is one of the uh, important aspect of the whole uh, achieving net zero uh, issue and carbon neutrality, but it is not that the building is not enough. We got the infrastructure, the public spaces, open spaces, and all together is the urban life, the city, the territories, the rural areas, everything has to be incorporated. And we have a target to achieve by 2030. So there are cities, at least I know that 20 cities signed, uh, agreed to uh, achieve carbon neutrality uh, on the on the new project by 2030 and uh, renew the uh, existing uh, uh, systems those uh, 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 emitting carbons that will be carbon neutral by 2050. So these are the optimistic that I know there are challenges but this can be achieved again if we involve all the actors. It is not only the government responsibility. It is also the stakeholder has to be there, and then again, stroke stakeholder has to have a discussion among uh, multilateral stakeholder uh, communication and exchange view and the researcher. This is very very important. If without innovative uh, solution, we can't. So it is achievable. I think uh, we look forward 2030. Then we reassess again. Thank you. Thank you, Ishtiak, and, and thank you too for your optimism. Of course, your optimism is, is from an um, urbanist and designer point of view, um, focusing on a broader range of issues and also a probably wider range scope of time. Um, I haven't realised how good you two, this combination, is. Um, until the, the, the completion of your, both of your presentations. Professor Young focuses in, mainly in the rural area and is primarily a scientist and an engineer. And Ish, you focus in the urbanised areas, you work in many international organisations and you are primarily a designer. And so um, you must be very different, yet you share this faith of carbon neutrality um, so, to me, I, I, I can't resist this question, this curiosity, that to you, each one of you, is carbon net zero more of a qualitative issue or of a quantitative issue? Maybe this time you go first, Ish. Yeah, thank you. Very, very good question. I mean, this has been an uh, issue... Uh, I mean, there is a debate that whether we count the numbers or the uh, qualitative uh, non-numbers things. As an architect, I've been working with the uh, human habitat for the uh, last seven years. And also, I'm practicing in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, all over the country, in the rural and also urban areas. Data is very important. Numbers are important. Without numbers, we cannot come to them. Uh, 
solution. So as an architect, when you come to a solution as an architect, this is, uh, becomes a qualitative uh, issue. Uh, Professor Young has shown two projects that depicts the carbon net zero and uh, with the devices and uh, with the technology. I have experienced one of this type of building in Singapore as well. They try to achieve the carbon neutrality there. But end of the day, how it affects the people's life. So the passive way you can do many things in our region, in our uh, uh, I mean, uh, countryside, there are traditional matter process where people live for a long time. All you have to gather knowledge and come up with a solution to that. So, uh, quality of design can change people's life. So, with this number, we must come up with a qualitative uh, design process and it's a, it's, a, it's a marriage in between numbers and the non numbers thing. Non major root things is like the happiness. The climate change is something people are uh, unhappy about. So, how do you make them happy? So, this is very, very important that putting an electricity in a rural area in Bangladesh in next year, our country will be fully. Uh, uh, electrified uh, uh, network within the network. It was an energy hungry country. Now we are going to achieve it. But in doing so, a single electrical bulb light in a rural area can bring an happiness to people's life. This can be done in many ways. If you do it in a sustainable way, in a design way, in an innovative way, that's the best way. So I think this is a uh, it's a marriage between uh, numbers and the quality together. Thank you. Very well put, Ish, and very persuasive. Um, Professor Yang, do you also agree this marriage between the numbers and the quality? Yes, I do. Um, uh, as a building scientist or engineer, uh, I work with numbers all the time. <laughs> so uh, actually, in the past, uh, we have whole community has been developing a series of metrics how to measure the building energy consumption and now we add the new metrics about the carbon um, yeah. issue so this is a new thing for the whole engineering community uh, so I, I think the goal is simple so we want to go to uh, have a staged uh, process to reach the carbon neutrality but how to reach there and by what time to reach there and in what pathway to get there, we need to have some numbers uh, in mind. Uh, on the other hand, the goal is not about the number, the goal is about the quality mm -hmm. of our buildings, our community, and our city, and also the quality of service. So I don't see any conflict between the numbers and the quality, uh, but I see a lot of agreement uh, among these, so just a different ways of, of thinking or working. So this is my, my first point. Uh, second point I want to make is actually made a very important, very interesting uh, comment about the urban and rural thing. So I think uh, the whole building community uh, or uh, let's say talk about the, the, the carbon neutrality, we certainly want both the cities and the rural areas to go together to reach the carbon neutrality. Uh, but the, the thing is, um, um, to the, the difficulty to reach the neutrality is different. Uh, for the carbon neutrality, other than energy conservation through good design, through envelope, through reduction of demand, there's also another important component, and that is to obtain sufficient amount of renewable energy. Ah. But if you look at the cities, or very large cities, usually you, you have a hard difficulty to find the space in order to create sufficient amount of renewable energy to match the demand. But in the rural area, it's a totally different story. So there is sufficient space for solar PV, and they have biomass available, and wind energy is easy, easily accessible. So 
That's why starting from rural and then slowly back to town and then back to small cities and then to the large cities, I think that could make these things a little bit easier. If we do the other way around, although cities have a lot of resources, a lot of money to do this kind of effort, but the cost would be too high uh, because we have uh, so much limitation to reach that. Of course, we can do whatever we can to get to there. So, but at the end, for example, if the energy, renewable energy is generated from the urban, the rural area, and then we transfer that to the urban, that can also be counted as renewable in the city. But if we do the other way around, then we don't have that infrastructure at the beginning. Then it's very hard to say that our city has reached carbon neutrality. So I think the approach could be different, but at the end, cities and, uh, and rural villages and towns, they have to go all together and go to the same, same point. Great point. Um, thanks to both of you. You seem to promote this ancient marriage between architecture and science and technology. And also numbers, of course, they are necessary but not sufficient preconditions towards a quality, happier life. Very good point indeed. Um, I believe this talk will go on um, for a long time, this marriage between architecture and science. So both of you mentioned about the quality of life, about the way of life. So let's zoom in a little bit into the coming way of life, this carbon neutral way of life. How much do you think will carbon net zero affect our way of life, in particular about all the convenience and the comfort that have been taken for granted for many, many decades? Will it eventually be necessary to have some moral or ethical support for carbon neutrality? In other words, is it necessary to give up some of our comfort in order to reach, to achieve carbon neutrality? Professor Yang. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a very important question. So um, when we think about quality of, of the building or quality of service or quality of life for the inhabitants, uh, I think that's the goal. Um, so how to reach there? Uh, I think uh, we have to think this way collectively. Um, so we have to understand their real demand and their real need. That's important. So their health requirement, comfort requirement, etc. So, uh, for example, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, architects, engineers have a good tradition for a long time to utilize the natural way to make people happy. Mm -hmm. For example, when you have the natural lighting, people will enjoy that much better than artificial lighting. So in that way, uh, it saves energy, it reduces the carbon footprint, it also improves the quality of life. So that's a good thing. So we can set up, we can actually find out a lot of these kind of examples. But I would like to also point out that the industrialization really sometimes is not making full consideration of the carbon things. So industrialization is actually looking for efficiency, productivity. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that the power generation is highly efficient. So that's an industrial, industrialization concept. Now we want to try to combine that into our natural kind of things and combine these two com concepts together and not to compromise people's requirement. So I would like to say that at the end, there could be a lot of possibility that carbon neutrality won't affect quality. But in some small exceptions, it could be. But we try to make the impact as minimum as possible. So as an architect or engineer, I think we should have this capability to do that. And I don't see a non resolvable conflict between these things. So that's my thought. Brilliant. What about you, Ish? Um, thank you. Uh, it's, it's obvious that industrialization has this impact on uh, the quality of life, the natural way of doing things, the natural 
consolations are being challenged. When you build a large infrastructure, when you build a large building, my question is, do we need a large building? When do we start making big buildings? And when do we make our life miserable? Our eminent architect from uh, our region, Charles Korea, has written a book. He mentioned that uh, big cities are a terrible place. So anything big is actually uh, not human friendly. It's out of scale. So when we make a big structure, big thing, then we have to make a depend on technology. We have to depend on the uh, artificial solution. You rightfully mentioned the room I'm sitting at the moment has got a natural light coming from the right side. And I'm enjoying the daylight and it's on my face. I don't have an additional lighting on my face. So why don't we appreciate it? So quality of life is a matter of how you look at it. The change in the thinking process. You mentioned about comfort level. Uh, a rich man's comfort may be a poor man's luxury. So his demand is very low and you can easily satisfy him with the conventional local technology or traditional methods that mean just improve portion of that that is more cost effective. But obviously when there is uh, is required, there are cases where you need an artificial intervention that has to be done, that I can understand. Like in a hospital, uh, uh, in our uh, SDG book, we got some examples from uh, for well-being structures, hospital designed by mass design. They have came up with a new uh, uh, typology that all hospital beds should be facing towards window. Then you can reduce down the uh, illness of the people, and it can be very well managed. That so looking at the natural light, enjoying the natural light can be a good solution. Usually we used to put the hair up towards the window. Uh, so these are the basic way I will always try to address. Uh, as I mentioned, only 2 to 3 percent is our urban area, but we concentrate more people in these urban places. But look at the territories, look at the uh, rural areas where the concentration is left, the solution can be very well done uh, with a very cost-effective way. Why don't we look at those things first? Uh, especially as you have, you have shown uh, a project in the village where uh, the community has been uh, uh, in a small number, it's a smaller group, that you can handle more. Uh, just uh, uh, weeks back, uh, World Economic Forum has published a report where they mentioned that uh, in the race to uh, coming for carbon neutrality, uh, the cities in Africa and Asia, uh, almost 70% of the cities will, uh, will join in the race. And uh, these are the new cities or less intervened cities that can be addressed more. So these areas, well, there is an uh, issue of uh, people not exposed to the artificial environment or large project or big infrastructure. Then we can, the solution is easier for us and the quality of life can be uh, achieved with much less intervention. And remember one thing, the cost is another issue. Like, uh, is an, is an, is an, uh, in, in, especially in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there is a new trend that everybody wants to become a, a, a smart city. So how do you achieve that? So people started investing in the technology, CCTV camera putting it everywhere, the sensors are everywhere. But first you build your road. Let people walk, let people have the sidewalk, let people have the open space. Instead of this, we, we come up with a more technology. So there is a fear. There is a fear that to improve the quality of people's life, we have to think about how uh, read the people's mind. Uh, the public space, open space, uh, uh, people's living room outside uh, uh, his, his own uh, uh, territory of the home, uh, the street in front, the sidewalk. He has to let him walk. 
get him feel that he is uh, he's feeling good in, in, in his home. In Bangladesh at this moment, most of the houses used to have an uh, overhang roof so that uh, with, with the window, so that when air comes enter the houses, they have to pull down with the shaded area then enter to the living part. But now we have cut down all the shade, it's straight away comes to your home and these are mini more air conditioned nowadays. 50, 60 years back, the air condition was not in prerequisite. So you can see that the, through design, we can change actually our behavior, our living pattern. Veranda uh, is an, uh, for Malaysia, our, uh, another esteemed uh, architect from our region, Kenya, wrote a book in 1980s, the Veranda City, Malaysia. I look at Malaysia, it's uh, full of high rise buildings. It's, not sustainable, I, I, I don't think. This is not climate friendly city. But it's supposed to be a uh, low rise, uh, walkable city, but it's not anymore. So we have to think about those people who talk about sustainability. Before sustainability, what came in 2015? Before the climate change came, uh, the world came uh, here. The architects, many of our architects, I've started thinking about the mother part. So we have to be very uh, sympathetic what we do because whenever we build something, we architects, engineer, we, uh, we, we we touch the ground and ground should be touched very lightly. There are architects who are working around the globe to touch the mother art very lightly so that we don't disturb. So whenever we touch, whenever we build, we do harm to the nature, we generate uh, carbon and we end up with uh, misery to this mother earth. So my point is be passive and be happy and change the process, thinking process. Be happy with what you have. Then it's an, uh, design is very, very easier for us. As an architect, for us, if there is any um, any challenges comes into we have to resolve this. So solution providing is an one of the uh, interesting part of architects to be in, in the design process, as well as uh, the engineers. You try to resolve when there is a problem. So problem solving activities is, is the design I think. And uh, whenever it comes to make people happy, we will keep on continuing innovate. In the very idea. The project I have shown is across from uh, developed world to developing countries to uh, least developed countries across the globe. And they have come up with their own way of solutions just to make people happy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ish. Uh, you, you remind me of, of many of the classic reflections on science and technology and this false faith in so-called progress and evolution. And Andrew Benjamin's wording of this word phantasmagora about progress. Um, that way of thinking certainly helped us to be more reflective and to be more critical of what way shall we live? What kind of comfort is comfortable enough? Thank you very much indeed. So let's move on to the final question. A question about priorities and something that is about to take place in the future. I would like to ask both of you to mention maybe each of you three to four priorities if you are to design a built environment from scratch or to modify an existing built environment. What are the priorities if we are to achieve carbon neutrality and what is your comment on these very, very sci-fi ideas like using photosynthesis to grow materials, to grow buildings rather than building them? Um, Professor Yang. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I uh, maybe uh, first the top priority in my mind, I think uh, I just saw the very nice concept that is to work with the environment rather than fight with the environment. 
So I think that's a very philosophical important to us. So I, I would say try to look at the nature and then work with the nature and uh, obtain whatever we need from the nature, like the energy, the water, and uh, materials, and that kind of thing. So that can uh, have a long-lasting impact. I think uh, architects, engineers, urban planners have a much bigger responsibility compared to other professions. For example, if I'm a manufacturer, I make this cup, and I made a mistake. I can correct that after next year, and then I make a new one, and then that's okay. And I'm a cell phone maker, and I make a mistake, and I change it. I change uh, something, and then next year it will be a new thing. But this is not going to work for architects. Once you build a building, and build a city there, it will be there for how many years? There's no way, no chance to do much correction. So that makes things very, very difficult to correct things. So you have to make it right at the beginning. <laughs> That's why architects, we are always making mistakes. <laughs> tradition gained by generations. <laughs> so in the future, I, yeah, in the future, I think people really need to have uh, some new, fresh mindset, keep the respons responsibility and sustainability, carbon neutrality, that kind of thing in mind, in our design, in our planning. And then I think that should be the right thing to do. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Yang. Ish, what is yeah. your take on this question? Yeah. I think we have got two parts. One is the one if you get a project, then how do you go through this? And also with the, the technology. So, um, um, if the project, where it is, I mean, the place is very important. So, I think if you really want to uh, go through uh, the, to achieve carbon neutrality and also uh, the net zero is an, as our Professor Young mentioned, is a very difficult part. I will look for the cultural part of the project, the case. This is very, very important. We have to start with culture and heritage development, and that will really, uh, start uh, leading towards uh, sustainable uh, uh, net, achieving net zero. Because uh, that has to be resilient so that if anything goes wrong, as Professor Young just mentioned, then can we rectify? Yes, there should be an provision so that it can, if there is any disaster, it has any problem, we can build back better. This is very, very important. Uh, I mean, uh, you build uh, the, uh, something very big. The local community should be able to rebuild it. So self building is very very important. I, I'm, I'm looking for uh, one thing is that if it is a rural area, so community participation through how we can build it through the community participation, and this is where the culture comes, the heritage comes, the people mind comes. So a self building participatory process that can be also embedded into the design. Uh, how, how, how we can engage local people with the local material and like I know the touch will be something very local but it is not uh, uh, long lasting but we can introduce some other material like people are using uh, uh, solar panel from uh, food wastage uh, people are using uh, curtain wall from curtain from algae and uh, light powered by uh, photosynthesis. So these are the innovative way we have to embrace, we have to promote. Uh, at the moment in the world, I mean these are very uh, uh, small initiative, but this has to be the extreme. My point is the carbon neutrality. Uh, a net zero issue should be the mainstream, it should not be uh, as an alternative solution. So, new innovation is the key. And we have to think about when you get a problem, as you mentioned, if you have a project, so I have to obviously think about the local people, local value, and but then again, also innovation. And this innovation can be uh, 
with uh, ecologically balanced solution, with eco-based solution, environment-friendly solution. So you have, you have to be very innovative already. Like today, I mean, look at our, everybody we are holding a mobile phone in our hand. Uh, they are actually related five things, camera, video, audio, tab, computer event today. So we never thought of that someday we will hold one device in our hand and get rid of other things. In the building industry, I do believe those innovative ideas, technology, science, numbers will help us to resolve many, many issues. So uh, I'm very optimistic about it and uh, that is very important that the infrastructure like you built a large power station or large uh, water treatment plant. Instead, we can go for a community-based small solution. But in the engineering science, it will say that how to do that. But that's the innovation where we have to find out how we can generate small uh, generate power from a small plant. And then because part of architecture, designing the whole system, it becomes part of our thinking process and also if it is achievable, if we really, really engage uh, uh, the local people at the participation. I give you one example, I will uh, end with this. Uh, there is a new project coming in in Hong Kong. They are building and uh, uh, it's like co-housing with participation from the local people and addressing all the SDG goals together. So uh, similar that is happening in Copenhagen. So these are the this is a small project, but it has a community engagement and uh, all the issues of uh, producing their own gas, producing the electricity in the community. So these are the way of thinking. We used to think 20 years back that this is an idea; it cannot be happen. So your idea is that whether these are. Uh, practical or not, I will say this is relevant at the moment. The relevant is the word we should take it forward that we have to find the relevancy. This is no way we cannot ignore it. This is coming, this is imminent, and these are uh, not only practical, this is relevant for us. We have to make it, if it's not practical, we have to make it practical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ish, and that is an extremely architectural answer. So what are the priorities? Always the place, the people, and the tradition, the culture, and innovation. And talking about innovation, certainly relevance would force us, would encourage us to make everything as practical as they can, and let technology and science serve good design of the future. What better to end this discussion today? I believe the audience have already benefited from this discussion a lot. Everyone should be, and I believe you already are, a little bit smarter than before the presentations and the discussions. And it's all thanks given to these two distinguished panelists, Professor Yang Shidong and Mr. Ishtiak Zaya Tita. They are the leading figures of the SDG and carbon neutrality field. They are also great thinkers of our time. We thank for them for their contribution to the discussion and to the RIBA China app. We don't have a physical audience at the moment, so we believe a great round of applause was already played in everyone's ears. So let's thank these great two panellists again, and see you next time in our next River China programme. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really Goodbye. a big pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.